Hello everyone, thank you to ACLU and Mutual for the organization of this event in such a lovely venue. Um, it's for us, with uh, Chris Gomez, who's the co-editor of this book, uh, a pleasure to be here launching it along with friends and, and colleagues and also some journalists. Because really, there is so much convergence and collaboration and synergies uh, uh, between what we're doing. So, uh, Steffi just saved me half of my presentation because one of the case studies that I had to uh, tell you about was exactly about HGLU because one of the co-authors of the book, contributors of the book, is here, uh, Catherine Sicking, and, um, and she'll be speaking in the next panel. So, I'm wondering what I should add, but I, I will add a few things uh, by way of, of uh, putting this conversation in comparative perspective. So I will not uh, speak about Hungary or Colombia or Venezuela or any country in particular. And what I'm going to try to do in the next few minutes is to draw some commonalities across different national uh, contexts uh, that justify our use in this book of the populist frame. Why populism? Why, why is it that we can put such different, seemingly different contexts, like from Russia to the US, from Hungary to India, from Venezuela to Turkey, under this rubric of populism? And uh, why is it that populism defined in the way that I'm going to propose poses very serious challenges to human rights? That's the basic a purpose of, of the few slides that I'm going to show you in a minute. So a uh, succinct way to put it is this, right? Why all these people in this picture, right? I'm always missing, and then you will remind me of the uh, Netanyahu here in this picture. I promise that we did a similar presentation in Stockholm, and the planning for the Justicia um, uh, event as well. And, uh, and for some reason I keep forget this has, it's, it's like a faux pas, it's something psychological. I always forget to add Netanyahu, who in uh, Israel is rolling out similar policies uh, to the ones that I'm going to describe. So uh, let me uh, begin by saying that populism means very different things in different regions of the world. So there's no one definition of populism. Populism, in fact, in Latin America has a long tradition of um, embodying or, or encapsulating <coughs> relatively progressive left-leaning uh, social inclusion policies, right? And, and there's a, also a whole populist brand in the U.S. that also means economic redistribution and anti-elitism and inclusive uh, socioeconomic policies. But there are also, in the way that we're using the, the term in this book, uh, with Chris uh, and some of the uh, contributors to, to the volume, we mean a more contemporary uh, meaning uh, of, uh, of the word, and it's more precise than uh, the ones that, uh, at least in Latin America, we have used so far. So I'm going to make split. Okay, so you know most of these characters, right? We could go, I don't have time to go through all of them uh, in a kind of a geography and political uh, test. Uh, but uh, uh, the question is, why is it, what is it that their policies have in common for our purposes, uh, for uh, civil society states? So, two traits. One is anti elitism uh, And I'm taking this from a really uh, excellent book by uh, 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 John Berner, uh, who, uh, what, which is entitled, uh, why populism? Uh, and anti-elitism, of course, uh, is a, a central trait of any populist agenda in that um, an elite defined in very, very diverse terms is the target of kind of a, of a bottom-up revolt. So, for example, uh, I'll give you two very different examples. Uh, in the US, uh, Trump uh, branded himself as rebelling against the Washington elite, represented by a Clinton, right? In India, it's Modi, the Modi government, saying, well, enough with the uh, privileged elites and the, and the minorities that have taken oversight power in India, meaning the Muslims, right? In Turkey, it's uh, Erdogan against the secularist establishment, and so on and so forth. So just, just, just listen of these examples 
shows you that the elites can be very malleably defined. Uh, and they can include, symbolically, the, the idea of the elite can be symbolically enlarged so as to incorporate even marginalized minorities, like the migrants. So why do the migrants, uh, and then I won't give you specific examples, uh, but uh, why do the migrants get privileged treatment relative to the national? So they, the migrants, who by definition are a vulnerable minority, get branded as uh, also part of the privileged elite, so to speak. But anti-elitism definitely is one of the two key traits of, of populism. This is a, uh, a necessary, but not a sufficient condition uh, for populism uh, to uh, exist in the way that we're uh, treating it here in, in the book. Uh, because there are also progressive brands of uh, anti-elitism. So any form of progressive politics or redistributive politics is somehow anti-elitist. Because if you, to put it in terms of the Occupy movement, if you are advocating for the rights of the 99%, and saying the 1% has too much power and too much money, that by definition is anti-elitism, and the elite is the 1%. Uh, the explosive combination is uh, anti-elitism with anti-pluralism, right? meaning uh, that um, populism, the way that we uh, define it here following the recent literature, is makes a fundamental moral claim, which is that there is a real people in opposition or in contrast to everyone else. So the real Turkish people, the real Venezuelan people, the real Americans, as from lost to say, right? Versus the elite, versus the non-real, versus the fake news media, and so on and so forth. Uh, so by definition, if you exclude a large chunk of the polity from the realm of citizenship, you're making a, 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 a pretty strong assertion that there is a whole sector of the population that is not a subject of rights, right? And this is, this is what populism so defined is so, so challenging and so dangerous to democracy and to human rights. In the end, it's, uh, I have some quotes here. This is Theresa May, also, uh, this is the, and the uh, elitist part, she said this in the context of the Brexit uh, uh, referendum, and she said, well, if you're a citizen, if you believe you're a citizen of the world, you're a citizen of nowhere, right? Like you, you float, you guys who believe in, in human rights and not from a politism, you're, you're rootless, right? And, and you're not rooted here in this land. And more poignantly, uh, Erdogan has all this uh, very, very effective, but pretty nasty one-liners said once, cried, uh, shouted to the opposition in, 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 in public once, well, we are the people. Who are you? Right? So this is the us versus them. And represented the people, and this is a key set. There is one leader, usually a male uh, uh, leader, representing, embodying the whole real people. He and only he can represent that people, right? Those people. And it's a quality of a politics of us versus them. Right? So uh, Amnesty has a really nice report from last year entitled Us versus Them, the Politics of Demonization. Um, and you can find it, and we've done that with uh, Chris in the book, track down specific quotes. You know, it could be in Hindu, in Spanish, in English, in Hungarian, in, in, in Turkish, you name it, it's very similar statements by uh, leaders like Putin, like Duterte here, uh, and, and Maduro. So this example, or this sample, shows you that the populism strand cuts across the left-right divide. So the way in which we're using it and the way that we think it's most useful to use the, the populism framework, some other people that feel it awesome, have written about the populist challenge also along these terms, uh, does not uh, overlap with the left-right distinction. So you can have right-wing populists like Erdogan or left-wing populists like Maduro. So since we uh, are based in Colombia, we know very well what it is like to 
to work with uh, colleagues living under left-wing authoritarian populism, which is Maduro. And so we, we, there's an influx of uh, around 2 million Venezuelans crossing over the border. This is the Syrian crisis in Latin America that's not as known, unfortunately, around the world. And it is propelled by uh, as, as an authoritarian government, populist authoritarian government, uh, that uh, is inspired by leftist ideas, and I would say that they have dropped those, but, uh, but, in, but it is clearly aligned with uh, leftist politics. And I'll have to end soon, so I'll, I will give you a flavor for the, what's most important in our book, which is the, uh, the subtitle to the book is uh, A New Playbook for Human Rights Actors. And the spirit of what will be discussed in the second session, we're very much on, uh, in the business of finding solutions, right? Some, some academics, we, uh, I personally spend part of my time in academia, part of my time in, in activism. Activists, some, activists, some academics uh, think that they can afford to diagnose the, the problems and say nothing about the solution. I don't uh, subscribe to that academic view either, but if you have an activist and advocacy hat and you care and you're active in, in, in everyday human rights uh, advocacy and politics, well, there's no option but to try to come up with the responses and solutions. And this is why, uh, in light of all the challenges that we diagnose in a very similar way to how the ECLO um, report does it, uh, our interest and our next step in our work is to um, find out whether there are strategies, promising strategies, that can be found in the places and the locales and the countries in which NGOs and other human rights actors are uh, addressing or facing up to these challenges. Right? So what is it that we can learn from the case study? We can learn for Venezuela uh, from the case study that Steffi just sketched uh, uh, from HDLU. What is it that can be learned from the great work being done by Turkish activists to try to circumvent the, the, you know, the draconian limitations on the freedom of the press in, in Turkey. What is it that we can learn from uh, Gandhi-like movements in India, uh, like uh, that put together by one of the uh, contributors to this volume, Harsh Mander, to confront um, ethnic and religious hatred on the part of, of the government. Uh, and this is why, and I'll end with this, uh, we're now, uh, the second stage of, of this project is to collect and systematize those ideas and those innovations. Uh, just as authoritarian government, uh, public authoritarian governments seem to be copying each other, as if there were a populist playbook, right? That is, this is the origin of the, of the, of the title here. Uh, if you look at the foreign Funding restrictions, they look very much the same as the, the, as, uh, the Russian initial uh, law. So it got copied everywhere. So it shows up not just in Hungary, but also in Venezuela, of all places. So, uh, the idea here is that there should be a counter playbook, uh, uh, a similarly uh, active, dynamic um, process of emulation and positive demonstration among human rights organizations and, and activists to confront the populist challenge. I'll end with that.